We begin this morning with an appeal to the world. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is calling for everyone on earth to join the fight against Russia. Ukrainian forces right now are fighting the Russian military on multiple fronts. Russian troops have moved into Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. People are being told to stay inside their homes because fighting is turned into urban warfare. It's out in the streets. Now, Russia has claimed its attacks are aimed only at military targets, but you've seen the pictures and you see them in front of you now. We've seen damage to neighborhoods, to schools. Ukrainian President Zelensky accusing the Russian army of killing civilians. The last night in Ukraine was brutal. There were shelling again, bombarding of residential areas, civil infrastructure. There is not a single facility in our country that the occupants consider an unacceptable target. Now this morning, Zelensky is rejecting calls to hold peace talks with Russia in Belarus. I mean, he says he is ready to meet with Russians, but he will only do so on neutral ground. In the meantime, the U.S. and its European allies are working on additional measures to slow Russian aggression, agreeing to cut off select Russian banks from SWIFT, that's the Society for Worldwide Interbank uh, Financial Telecommunication. It severely limits uh, their access to the international banking system. Our CNN reporters are covering the story from all angles. Let's begin with Alex Marquardt. He's live for us inside Kyiv. And Alex, fighting has intensified across Ukraine. But from last night, your vantage point, you could see the skies lighting up. And earlier you shared that you were hearing explosions not far from where you're standing right now. Uh, bring us up to speed with the latest on what you're seeing. Yeah, Boris, the fighting intensifying not just across the country, but around this city as well. In just the past hour, uh, there does appear to be an acceleration of the pace of the bombardment. Uh, we are up on the roof of our hotel, and from here, uh, we've heard many distinct blasts uh, in the distance uh, to the northeast, to the north, uh, and to the west. Uh, most of the explosions that I've heard have been coming from that direction in the northeast, uh, but on the other sides, there are uh, at least four distinct visible uh, plumes of smoke. Uh, now, this is a city that is essentially under lockdown. There is a curfew until tomorrow morning. You can certainly imagine uh, that it could be extended. So this is a, a, a much louder day, if you will, than yesterday. And this comes after last night when we got uh, warnings that there could have been uh, a widespread aerial bombardment uh, by Russian planes over Kyiv. Uh, that didn't really materialize, but there were two significant significant explosions just after midnight uh, to the southwest near uh, near Kyiv's second biggest airport. Uh, the first one resulting in a massive fire. Uh, you could see the flames uh, glowing uh, in the clouds above it uh, for hours. And, and even now, uh, more than 12 hours later, you can still see the, the smoke from that. And then to the east of Kyiv, in the second biggest city, Kharkiv, uh, the fighting is also intensifying. Uh, we know that there are street battles between Russian and Ukrainian forces, that Kharkiv residents uh, are being told to stay inside. That is very close to the Russian border, where our colleague uh, Fred Pleitkin uh, has been seeing rocket fire going out. Uh, but the, the, the Ukrainian forces do appear uh, to be putting up a good fight. This is day four of this invasion. Uh, the Russian military is clearly not where they expected to be. Uh, there had been some forecasts that perhaps Kyiv could fall and 24 to 48 hours. Uh, the Russian, the Ukrainian military putting up a good fight. Russian personnel uh, are being killed. Uh, their, their tanks, their uh, weaponry, their trucks uh, are being hurt, uh, are being destroyed rather. Uh, their supply lines are being stretched. They're having difficulties getting things like fuel. Uh, but this is clearly an all-out fight uh, for the Ukrainians. President Zelensky uh, dismissing this Russian claim that, the, that, they, the, that they are only targeting military installations. He has said uh, that it is clear that they are going after everything. He said last night was brutal. Uh, not a single target uh, that the Russians consider unacceptable. And as a result, uh, Zelensky has issued this call to arms, uh, not just for every Ukrainian who is able to fight, but now also uh, saying that they are creating, creating an international legion uh, so that anybody who wants to come from abroad can also join this fight against Russia. Boris Christie. Mm, Alex Markhart, do take good care of you and your crew there. Thank you. Now, uh, he was just mentioning Russian vehicles entering the city of Kharkiv. 
Uh, that's Ukraine's second largest city. Officials are urging residents stay in shelters. Don't travel anywhere because the fighting is happening in the streets. We want to take you to Kharkiv now and CNN Prima reporter Darius Domatova, who appears to be the last foreign TV reporter in that area as this firefight is happening. Daria, you and your cameraman are, are holed up inside a, uh, your hotel in a makeshift shelter. Walk us through what you're experiencing and, and what's happening where you are. Good morning and thank you for having me. Yes, and uh, as you can see, we are currently in the hotel, in the coffee place, which is connected to the hotel. All the windows are secured right now, as you can see with the wooden desks, all the doors are closed. And also the local people who are staying here with us just moved stuff back to the lobby, to the place where are no windows, because there would be more danger in case of attack. It's what we hear from outside, uh, from time to time, we hear loud gunshots. Uh, we basically, we think it, uh, should be the AK-47, the famous uh, Kalashnikov. Also, we hear the artillery. And uh, around the city, we see the smoke. Daria, how many people are in the hotel with you? Can you gauge that and, and where they are? Uh, yeah, there is uh, around 20 people, but of course uh, we cannot show you the whole place uh, because of the security. We don't know if uh, someone is monitoring us or know where we are right now. So basically that's all what I can say right now. Understandably. Daria Stromatova, thank you so much. Uh, please take good care of yourself, of your crew there. We're thinking of all of you. Thank you, Daria. Okay, let's talk to Arwa Damon, because she's talking about the invasion that's creating this humanitarian crisis at Ukraine's border with Poland. More than 350,000 people are leaving Ukraine now. Uh, Arwa, you've brought us such emotional stories from these people who are leaving fathers and, and brothers and, and, and husbands in Ukraine because they have to stay and fight. What are you seeing there this morning? You know, it's extraordinary because every single person who you talk to, and I think this is important to remember, has their own unique, to a certain degree, experience of what it was like for them to have to say goodbye to those who they love as they left them behind. But it's not just that. We're right now at a reception center, and by the time the vast majority of these families actually get here, and you have some new arrivals um, over in this direction, the vast majority of them would have gone through days on the road. I'm talking about 36 to 48 hours walking and waiting out in the cold. The stories we're hearing about these overnights in these freezing temperatures with no food, no water, no bathroom, with little children. And then as they get closer to the actual border crossing from the sheer panic and the emotional agony of it all, it ends up largely being a free for all with people just trying to push through just to cross over to the other side. Now, once they actually get here, they're met at these various different um, makeshift reception areas that have cropped up either by family members, by friends, but then you also have this army of volunteers that right now is behind a police line because there are so many of them. And as these buses pull up, they'll hold up signs advertising locations that people who are arriving can get free rides to, locations where they can stay for free. So you do have this big sense of community once you actually hit this side. But none of that makes their experience any less agonizing. We have met sisters, two sisters who left their father behind. We have met wives who are now trying to cope with all of the children who left their husbands behind, some of whom have told their children, don't worry, daddy is going to be coming, not knowing if they were lying to their kids or maybe they hope telling the truth. You see these parents trying to be so strong, still trying to be heroes for their children, doing all that they can to mask their own fears and everything that they're going to. And earlier today, 
I just want to tell the story of one family who we met because they were actually from Afghanistan. They had fled Afghanistan in May, ended up getting asylum in Ukraine, and now they had to flee again. And their trauma, their agony, their fear, they know what this is. We've met families from Ukraine who have already been displaced more than once. A mother who was from the Donbas region, that is that area that was under separatist control, she had fled in 2014 only to find herself having to flee again. What a lot of those coming across the border are telling us, though, is that what's happening on the other side, the difficulty of just getting to safety, that is something that has to be addressed. There has to be more organization there because the temperatures are dropping. We're expecting rain, snow, and waiting outside the way they've been having to wait up until now is just going to become incredibly dangerous as well.